Welcome to Identity Unbox, where we provide mentorship and promote representation for Black professionals in the advancement of the Black community. We are seeking guidance from exceptional Black leaders, scholars, and professionals with expertise in their respective fields. We hope to foster a space that promotes authenticity, inclusivity, and restoration for our listeners while exploring the intersection of our personal and professional lives. This project is a culmination of our lived experiences as young Black professionals to transform our life trajectories to overcome adversity and reach triumph. Our intention is to inspire you on your path to discovering your purpose. In terms of the um, adverse uh, effects, I, I think certainly beyond the the fear that it causes and this intentional fear, and 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 um, especially to underrepresented, um, marginalized uh, communities and those working to advance the work, it's, it's, that's really intentional. But beyond that, it inhibits all um, the things that I spoke about um, a bit earlier, a diverse workforce that leads to greater innovation um, and inhibits our ability to address some of the most pressing societal um, issues um, and challenges. It impacts our ability to prepare our graduates to live and lead in an increasingly diverse and global global world. Um, and if we are going to um, be effective and thriving communities, um, people must be able to work across differences for a common good. And this is where people learn some of those skills and we need to be able to, to do that work here. Um, and at, um, we can't do it in higher education institutions. Where will it happen? Right. Thank you so much for that. You touched on so many good points and the importance of pursuing these changes in higher education, um, particularly going back a little bit. Um, you know, you discussed uh, DEI and it just made me think of how people tend to cling to the catchphrases like they'll see the acronym DEI and they'll instantly think, oh, critical race theory or Black Lives Matter. And, um, you know, people who don't really dive further into the nuances of the issues and just hear these little catchphrases on in mainstream media. Um, that's what they cling to. So then they associate DEI with something that they're opposed to. And I think, you know, that's what's sadly kind of contributed to this lack of understanding of the importance of DEI because people just attach it to the little buzzwords without actually doing the research. And people don't understand that DEI is more than race. It's about, uh, you know, people that have experiences like those who have been incarcerated um, that are getting out. It's people with mental and physical disabilities that cannot navigate certain systems in a way that others have the privilege of that are able-bodied or that don't have a mental disability. And so there's so much nuance to uh, DEI. And that's why now I try to actually say it out loud, like diversity, equity, and inclusion, because it's, it's the words uh, that matter. And those are aspects of society that are fundamental, really. And I think you're exactly right. And beyond, I, I well, a couple of weeks ago, I was at um, a national meeting for folks in roles like mine. Um, and um, the particular uh, organization that brought us together, they do a lot of polling and they will poll and they will ask questions like about, uh, and they'll, they'll poll and they look by across demographics, they look across political persuasion, you know, all of that, right? And they'll ask questions um, about, um, are you committed to um, DEI and stuff like that? And so, um, you know, uh, Republicans will be um, a lot um, know and um, you will have, um, of course, a lot of uh, liberal Democrats more, yes, independent somewhere in the middle. Um, but then when they ask questions like, um, are you supportive of colleges and universities educating students who are first generation, low income, from rural communities? You know, they got on and high yes across all, right? So again, for me, it's about we need to be better at telling a story, like it goes to what you said of getting really specific 
and moving away from just the broad like um, DI or if we're going to say diversity, equity, inclusion, but say it out and talk about what that really means. And each of those three things mean something different, right? And so really talking that through. So I think you're exactly right because um, um, we're at a time where um, unfortunately people don't take the time to um, do a deep, deep dive off and then learn for themselves um, about what's what. And and so we live in these sound bites where people can take, but well, DI is critical race theory. You know, it's so much more. It's not that um, at all. And, and it's much more complex than that. And we do need to understand the nuances. So, so thank you for that. Absolutely. And, I think that furthers your point earlier about how, you know, certain conservative groups are so good at creating strategies and, you know, pushing, uh, you know, their agendas forward because ultimately, you know, DEI is something that is, you know, progressive. It's something that's new. It's bringing new concepts and ideas to the forefront. And we, you know, when we just look at the facts, you know, this society, it, when you look at the history, it's been built and constructed for white straight men. And there's nothing wrong with being a white straight man, but that is what these systems are geared towards, um, you know, supporting and uplifting and maintaining that power structure. And so I think it's so easy for these groups to maintain control by sticking to those buzzwords. Um, and then furthermore, fighting to maintain the status quo, because we've seen it time and time again throughout history, change is uncomfortable. People don't want to necessarily learn new things, especially when the change might not benefit them um, and actually evaluating the meaning behind this change. And so I think when we break it down, you know, from a historical context and actually apply it to modern scenarios of what we witness today when it comes to inequities and just acknowledging the dark past of this country and how we can move forward um, to really just better the lives of everyone, because people think it's you know, we're trying to make, you know, some people's lives better than or give certain people special privileges. And it's like, no, we're actually trying to level the playing field and give those with those diverse experiences or that have societal disadvantages an upper leg so that they have those same opportunities. And I agree with you. We certainly do that work. And that's important work that we need to continue to do. And we also, as higher education institutions, we work to try to create spaces where all students can belong, you know, no matter their walk, walk to life. And so this narrative that by having these offices somehow where excluding others, like, no, there's lots of other things that happen in other places that these students can connect. And one of the things that I always point out, I should, we're in our 56th year of existence. And even though the name says off the minority affairs university, there's always been white students that's been a part of our programs. You know, different programs can move from uh, first generation, low income. We have programs that serve students who are um, previously in foster care. A lot of those students are, are white white um, students. And, and it was interesting to me, I was um, a few years ago, was doing COVID because we were on in this format in Zoom and there was a um, Washington State legislator, a uh, white male, um, on the panel. I was on it, and, and another person was on it. And so um, as we're doing introductions, um, and, and he's conservative Republican, you know, white male. You know, that's his, 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 um, his um, party that he's in. And he, so as he's doing introductions, he shares, and then he was like, it's so great to see you. He said, as a student, I was an ELP student, was an educational opportunity program student, so connected to your office and know the work that you do. I mean, so it's just, like, wonderful. Now, I thought about it, and I, I need to go back and figure it out. I was like, because we need allies like that to step forward and speak up, too. You know the value of what the work was for you because of the background that you were coming from. So there are other students including students of color, you need to also be telling that story um, and helping your colleagues understand there's value in that and it helps everyone. But also the one of the biggest challenges that we face is that people no longer see our education. Uh, many people don't see it as a, as, a, as a common good anymore. There used to be a lot of support because of the common good. We saw that what it did. I have a theory on some of that 
um, as to to why that is. I think some of it is the way we've messaged around the value of higher education and that it allows, it creates, you know, um, um, it can make people feel like they've been other, right? If they don't get a degree and, and all of that, including um, some um, um, lower uh, income whites or whites who chose not to um, get education. But I also think part of it is to, and this is part of anti-DEI backlash in some ways, um, I think it's it is um, it speaks to the success that we've had. That some may have seen that we've been too successful. There are too many people, um, too many black and brown folks that are in now in the C suites and that they're in colleges and universities and and still um, I get it. But if you still look at um, the um, Enrollment rates and graduation retention is still not enough. It needs to be more, but especially given the needs of the country. Um, and and then the other piece for me is this common good. Just thinking about the more educated people you have, um, the more uh, engaged history, um, the healthier people tend to, you know, all of there, all these other things that come with it. Why would we want that for? anybody that wants that right and so to actively work against that is it's troubling but it's it's where we are and i think it's really important um you know you'll hear me say going forward we need to be um smart but not scared and and i think that's true um but i think when you it's the time to also lean in and and um i was um i sat in on a webinar uh, last week and the webinar was doubling down on DEI and I appreciate that because it was more like, yeah, let's not, let's figure out how do we um, reaffirm our commitments, not walk away, reaffirm them. And uh, that's the conviction that I'm talking about. I want conviction. I mean, let's reaffirm those commitments and, and move forward together. Absolutely. I love that. And, you know, what you've been sharing, you know, what you shared in the beginning when you were uh, speaking about, you know, there are, there have always been white people in DEI programs when it comes to, you know, first generation white students, low income white students and things of that nature. I think it really speaks to your point of, you know, us needing to do a better job of explaining what DEI is. Um, I have a very, very close family friend um, who is a straight white man who uh, was in the, who was incarcerated and who's now released and worked very hard to get his degree and his education. And, you know, get a good job and now is a homeowner and has totally changed his life around. And I remember he was applying for a job and he was pretty sure he's going to get it. Um, and he didn't get it. And I was like, why did, why don't you think he got the job? And um, he was like, oh, because it was, they ended up going with the diversity hire, you know, because it was a, a black man. And that's, I guess what he was told is it was a diversity hire. And I was like, well, your experience is a diverse experience, you know, just where you came from to now. And so, I think, you know, those sort of things speak to how, you know, in these institutions and even in these conversations, it's great that we're speaking about this, that it's not so confined to race. Everyone has disadvantages and diverse experiences, while some experience those at a heightened level um, because of systemic factors that are undeniable. Um, you know, everyone, anyone can be included in DEI. So, and I think it's certainly important that we not discount that, and, you know, uh, at one point in time, I would have rolled my eyes by like, you know, like your, your, your family friend said, but I, I am learned of like, that's how they, they're feeling it. That's their experience. And that while I might disagree, um, that should be willing to listen and truly not try to um, invalidate what, what they say. And I think that's where some folks go immediately. And it's like, listen here. And, and similarly, I remember, um, I had a, 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 a professor I knew, a white male professor who was actually pretty good on the work. Um, and that's how I, I knew him, <clears throat> committed to DEI. And just in a conversation, I think it's, we've gotten to a point where I um, feel comfortable enough in a conversation he was saying to me, he said, you know, I, I admit that, um, he's like, I'm getting towards the end of my career, but I worry about the future for my white male son, you know, he's white, so my my son and then my grandson. 
and will there be opportunities for them and so forth. And I listened and, you know, I was kind of stuck, you know, yeah. and I did catch me off a bit, but I was like, okay, but I, I listened to that because I said, I, I could see how this might be the perception. But then I, I dove deep, took a little deep dive into some of the statistics. You know, I started looking at um, um, our Senate and who made up our Senate, our our Congress, who made up the Congress. I started looking at Fortune 500 um, CEOs and who those folks were. I started looking at um, um, the percentages of white male doctors and, and white male uh, health for, you know, it was just in high, high, high percentages, right, still. So I, I I gathered all that and I shared with um him just to see that for him to see like I understand that that could be perception and here's what the data shows um long way to go now having said that uh, having said that about uh, showing the data I've also in recent years especially around this work come to understand that. that Often, uh, you know, we're in a space where people don't care about data. They don't care about the facts. It's not really the logic. And so, and and this is where the meeting I was at, um, one of the, the posters said, it's about messaging. It's all about how you message. And so that's kind of what we were talking about earlier when you said that you, you're you very intentional about how you talk about, um, you say diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it goes back to when I was speaking about impact that we need to talk about what has been, see those are the, what are we messaging? How are we gonna tell the story of the why? This is why OBD is here and needs to be here for another 50 years because of the impact that we've had and continue to have and will have on these different populations. Um, but you will always have some people that feel like we've only gotten things just because who we are uh, of, of our our skin color, our gender. I mean, whatever it is, and there's no way to ever move beyond that. And it's kind of interesting because people talk about, you know, this is why there needs to be an into the eye office and this and that and other. And then people know that um, if students of color are at the university and they got there on their own, I'm like they have, and especially in a place like this, we got an anti, we an anti action state. So by virtue of they're here, um, they made it on their own accord. Um, but I think there will always be people who will feel that, believe that, and what I say to folks that you know early, I'm like you know that like kind of bug me a little bit, but also like at the end of the day, who cares? You know, how I got, it's what I do after I've been there. What's my impact? Speak to that. Let's talk about what I've done. Um, you can, you can never deny that. And, and let's talk about all of the legacies that have gotten into some of these IVs and stuff like that. Nobody ever questions that piece. Um, it's always interesting to me when you think about the military, you know, even that recent Supreme Court case, which was disturbing to me. And I was like, oh my, I can't believe the blatant that they, okay, you outlaw um, um, race and uh, admissions, except for the military academies. What? Excuse me. So we can <laughs> fight your wars? We can be. But we're not good enough to be in other academic settings or, you know, um, have our life experiences, our, our, um, the fact that there is ingrained racism be considered for admissions to every other institution except for the military academy. I mean, it's, it's deeply troubling and I always think about how, um, and, and I really thought a lot about this when I was in Tennessee and was going through that ordeal there. It's been at a, a SE East, you know, like there's sports for, but it's like you, so you want those, those, those black football players and other folk on that, on that football team and on the basketball course. So we good enough to run up and down your courts and your fields, 
But when it comes to us being in the classroom and the boardrooms, that's a problem. Um, and, and I think we need to just get real explicit with folks about that. And it's like, it is interesting how you can go out here and cheer on for um, all of these, these these athletes of color. And I've seen it at another institution. I won't name what, the institution. When I was there, and I remember we did not, I didn't actually say, we, the university um, did not admit um, um, a blue chip athlete who will be a top, top, top athlete did not admit the athlete and when that happens typically at most of these places for then there's another review and um and sometimes there's an appeal and it goes to the provost and that's what happened in this case at the institution i was at it's not here it's another institution so i went to the provost and and the provost denied and said no you know like again you know like there's we we don't want to set somebody up we don't think they could make it here and when I tell you the alumni, of course the coaches were upset, but the alumni folks, when they found out, I mean, like people were, I, but I was like, I'd like to see that same kind of effort and attention when um, a young person who um, know who has promise, who's gone through a lot that looks like you too, um, and they're turned away. I, I want to see that same kind of effort. And I just don't, I don't see that. I don't see people contacting the university, the president, the provost, and threatening, you know. So it's just, um, it's sad at the end of the day, um, but it also tells where it tells us where we're at. And and this is another little tangent, but I want to drop, uh, drop it in just because who knows who will see these things, um, including parents of top-notch athletes. One of the things that... Um, I've been really hardened by in recent years is that you have seen athletes get involved in some of the social justice issues, and particularly black and brown athletes. Um, and um, and I, I say this is really important because there's a reality, you know, like, again, people look at them, they listen to them in different ways. Now, what I would love to see from parents and some of these athletes, and I guarantee you, if it happened, it will change and certainly slow and maybe even reverse this anti-DEI uh, efforts. It's for folks to say, you know, like, so say I had a, a son or daughter, I don't, that who was a top-notch athlete and they had a son looking to play football, like blue chipper, um, everybody want him. And it's like, um, he, you know, to be able to say, well, his dream school was... Um, the University of Tennessee. That's where his dreams go. However, and they recruited him, but however, my child will not go to any institution in any of these DI, in these things where they have DI legislation. So that means uh, we're now looking at Michigan, we're looking at the University of Washington, we're looking at Ohio State, all of these others, USC. I guarantee you all that needs to happen is four or five times to the Alabamas, the Georgia, the Tennessee. And you would start to see some changes that would happen again. But now that's stuff that could happen, but it takes people. And sometimes, again, this is where I get upset because people are like, there's not, yeah, you could if you really want to, but I know people will, it's that self, it's a, it becomes about self. Well, if I go to Alabama, I got to get a chance of going to, to the and I feel it's like, but if you're good and you go to, you come to Washington or you go to Ohio State, it's not like you don't. For folks like that, you have some options. And so, um, and certainly as a parent, to be able to say that and be very clear and also be somewhat public about it. So with ESPN and others, I guarantee you, people will start to take note and um, well, either it was certainly slow, I guarantee you stop seeing in some of those states new legislation, um, and you might even see a rolling back of some things, um, because now if you have certain institutions like the ones I named, they're the only ones because of their ability to get the top talent to now one of these championships. And, the, and it's sad because... There's so many other things that are so much more important. You know, I love sports. I love athletics. I love my athletes. I support them here. I just went uh, last couple of years with um, 
um, um, Sheridan uh, Blanford over at Athletics, who is an associate um, AD for DEI, is a dual report of mine. And she asked me a couple in the last couple of years to attend the Black uh, Student Athlete Summit. Um, and and I've gone, so it has allowed me to get to know even some of the Black athletes here much more uh, intimately and have high regard for them all the things that they're doing um, to help make um, this institution better. And, and and most of them are really good students and beyond it, just good, good people. So love them, support them. And, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I mean, while I love my athletes, Am I my sports? There are so many other things I think we can agree that are much more important um, that people, but yeah, I know that people place a high value on premium here and they would listen to parents and athletes in a different way. So one strategy. Yes. Thank you so much for bringing that point up. We have not actually dove into it in that depth. So I'm just really glad that you talked about it because yes, there are so many other avenues. And I think a lot of times in our community, people are acting out of survival. And sometimes those student athletes see that's their only pathway out of poverty or to create a successful life for themselves or be able to give back to their family. So they really invest everything in themselves to be able to, you know, participate in those sports and they have their eyes on, they need to be in Alabama or in Ole Miss to be able to get where they need to go instead of actually thinking, well, maybe I should choose this institution that is academically rigorous and could set me up for success even outside of the athletics in case that doesn't work out or they get injured or, you know, something like that happens. But I agree with you that I think there is a lot of power with, you know, those student athletes and those families that are backing them and even the coaches too, to be able to say, let's shift you know, our interest to these other institutions that truly are supporting that holistic individual and not just looking at them as a product to exploit for the institution's benefit. Because, you know, I think that would really cause these institutions to reevaluate what their commitment is, you know, and what do they really prioritize, which means supporting diversity because it benefits everyone, like you said. And some people have looked at diversity as something that's taken away from those that are in power when really it's providing what those resources that people need that are, you know, most uh, disadvantaged. So being able to give them uh, that's what equity um, in comparison to equality, that it's more than just providing opportunity, but being able to actually set those people up once they get into these systems so that they can actually thrive and be successful. So um, yeah, I just appreciated that you brought that point up and would love, I know we've gone way over time, Ricky, and I, I want to make sure that's okay with you because we always do okay. this. Like we think, oh, it's going to be an hour. It never is. So yeah. if this conversation is so good. <laughs> um, but if there was one piece of advice you could give your younger self or young black professionals interested in pursuing a career in DEI or higher education, what would that be? And what are best practices to advance this work in bureaucratic institutions, particularly within the public sector? I know you kind of talked about that a little bit, but if there's anything that you wish you would have known, you know, as a younger version of yourself to prepare for what you would have been experiencing, like at Tennessee, for example, um, what would the, that advice have been? Yeah, I don't know. Um, that's a great question. And it's, um, it's, um, it's hard to really think about like one piece of advice um, that I would give. Um I, and I talked a little bit about it er, earlier about it's about it being hard not to personalize work that is deeply personal to you. And so um, understanding that um, it's important to be intentional about creating practices that you can do daily to take care of your yourself and to remind you of um, who you are, um, who you are, and um, and the value that you have beyond this moment, you know, and especially when you're going through things, and I think about, like, what I went to in Tennessee, and there's been other things that, that's been really hard and in those moments. Um, your identity can be so tied up in the work and the role and because it is deeply, it's deeply impersonal, uh, personal to you. 
I'd also um, encourage those who might be interested in doing um, the work professionally to only do so if they are in it for the long haul. Um, this work is ever changing. Um, it's challenging. Sometimes it's messy. Um, and there's also joy in it. Um, certainly, I talked about some of that earlier, seeing the evolution, the growth, the development of of, of young people. Um, but you have to deal with the other um, much more often than than um, we would like. Um, but we need people who will, will stick with it, who will take the long view um, and understand that the impact of the work is, um, it's not always seen in one year or even five years, but being able to have done it for a long time and then to look back the 20 year, like a 20 year journey and you look back and just say, you know, there has been some changes. There has been, so I've had some good impact along the way. I can point to this. I can point to that. You have, by now, I get folks out reaching to me. You know, I got a, um, yesterday, a, a text message for a, a person who I recommended for something and thanked me um, and said that um, he had told her husband that I really have been a sponsor of her over the years and she's so grateful for all those things you know and i'm not expecting things like that but it's it is to see and to see uh her growth and her journey and to see uh i talked about my fraternity brother who's a, a close friend now but he was a he was a student of mine initially you know early in my career you know when i was um we weren't too far apart in age because I, I was early in my my career but to see all that he's done and where he came from. And I remember he was one of those students <laughs> that um, I saw like that he, he, he was good, that he could do much better than what he was doing. And I would look at his, his, his transcript and his grades. And I said, look, bro, and I said, Hey, I said, from a lot of people, I was like, this is what they could do. I said, but I know you can do better than this. I said, I know you're capable. And what I always appreciate about because a lot of times in, in over my history having those kinds of conversations with people, students will get really defensive. But and he remember when he said, "You're right." He said, "You're right." I could. He's like, "I studied the night before the exam." I can't. He was, he said he owned it all. And I said, "Okay." He said, "I just but I just want to get this degree. I'm not looking to go further." I said, "Okay." I said, "You say that now." I said they change. You know, like you'll get to a place then you don't want to go grad school. And he's great. It's going to be hard with these grades. And I was like, and then, you you know, might do well on the test, but now you're, you're really dependent on, on whether somebody's going to give you a chance or not. What happens? He gets to his, his uh, senior year. He starts talking about what's the grass. And so we have those conversations with able to get him connected with some folks and help them. He went first and got a master's of public policy um, and after doing that, then he decided to go to law school. Um, again, here's somebody who didn't think they're going to go beyond undergrad. You don't know what you don't know, right, until you you start going through it. And so so you got to be in it for the, the long haul um, to see the, the progress. Um, otherwise, if you're looking in one year, kind of two years, I mean, it can really um, be deflating sometimes. And I always remind people that progress is a linear, you know, like we, we have some progress and then like this look now, I mean, then, you know, but you, you, you keep pushing at it. Um, one of the things being in the public sector that I'd also, um, I tell people about, and I, 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 when I'm interviewing folks that are looking to work in our area, I to make sure they understand that if, they're going to come into the unit. They have to understand that there are parameters in which we must do our work. There are legal, there are state and federal laws that um, really impact the way we do work and what kind of work sometimes even that we 
can do. And I know that sometimes people want to set all that aside and say there's a real commitment to. I'm like, there is, and we still have to abide by those things. So I think it's the way we, it's a better tact to um, determine what we can do within those parameters and those constraints and still have impact. Um, and some will say, you do it anyway. And it's like, and we can, you're right. And I might decide that at some time and understanding when I do that, I'm, I'm probably not going to be you know, here much longer. And that's okay sometimes um, if that's what you've decided. But sometimes people have to understand too, the things that people are asking us to do that would be unlawful also put the university at risk. And and that's why I stress that with them that there are larger issues at play even if we were to say, okay, you're right, we're going to set this all aside. There are certain things um, that, like, for example, that we did, that if we did, that we violated federal um, legislation, um, and it would take a lot. In summary, it had to be something awful for us to do, I'm sure. But the government, the federal government can say, you're no longer getting uh, federal um, contracts, grants and contracts. That also includes financial aid. So, who does that harm? Who acts? You know what I mean? So, there are larger things that often that we're thinking about and negotiating, navigating that sometimes other people don't have to. It's easy to sit back. So, so sometimes you'll hear, and you might hear now, um, Tiana, especially given your, um, your work with the, P, uh, um, the PSO, the professional staff organization, now that you're leading that. Um, I'm in spaces and people tell me, you know, they'll say you should be doing this and that and the other. And I get it from my team all the time. I was like, sounds nice. Sounds nice from where you sit. And part of what I'm saying is that there are so many, because you don't understand it. Like, there are things that you don't have to negotiate and navigate from where you are. Uh, but I do. And if you um, um, are in the future in these kinds of roles, you're going to have to, and you will understand more there. So, um, so look, that's, um, a little bit of um, advice that, that I would give. Certainly understand the um, where you're doing and the parameter in which they they um, people have to do their work in that, that environment. Thank you so much for that. That was so great in you explaining the nuance of actually working in these systems and the complicated like nature in which the system is designed that make it hard to just bust out and make decisions and I kind of want to further that uh, this question and ask you if you had any advice uh, for young folks and people in this issue space in general that have a hard time uh, navigating these conversations when there's so much division and tension currently in this country. Uh, you know, you mentioned earlier in the interview that, you know, you will have a conversation with someone and you'll agree on 90 percent of things, but you say one thing that they don't agree with and then they're dead to you. Um, you know, since we were already talking about it, for example, I'll uh, use my uncle's story again, how or my uh, family friend, he's kind of like a god uncle, but how he essentially grew up in poverty, went through the criminal justice system and made his way out, you know, and that was my initial reaction was to roll my eyes and say, you know, how many black people have gone through that situation and weren't able to even get a job or get an education and things or like that. Get the interview. Or exactly, or even get the interview. Um, and so that's initially where my mind went to, but I wanted to actually reflect and say, well, he had his own experience and I don't want to necessarily invalidate how he may feel. So how in these kinds of conversations where there's so much nuance, what advice do you have for people when they're navigating these tough situations where people just may not see, see eye to eye because they've had completely different lived experiences? Yeah, a couple of things. I think initially you said that if folks were that folks might be having a hard time having a conversation or reluctant to, and if that's the case, I would ask why. If that's the case as to why they're feeling that way, because that would give me some insight as to is it an environment? Uh, do they feel um, people are going to be receptive? They're going to be shut down. You know, do they not? Um, sometimes people don't feel as though they have the language, right? Um, 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 and they're going to be critiqued for that. And so those are all different different types of advice I would give based on each of those studies. So like certainly if 
they don't feel like they're adequately prepared to really have the kind of conversation um, using the language um, that's um, that's ever evolving. Um, there, there are things that they can do right to get up to to, to speed on that, and so I, I could recommend some some things there if it's really about the environment and feeling as though the leadership or that there, there might be some ramifications there if they do, then that's a different situation, right? That we would we would talk to, but in general, um, and having these tough conversations um, mm-hmm. across difference. Um, one of the things I often say to folks, and, and I'm going to tell you, I haven't always been the best. I'm not the best now at it. Um, I'm, I'm growing and evolving and trying to be better is to um, be a bit more curious. So when people say things um, like your, you know, the family friend you talked about, as opposed to immediately having a reaction and kind of, and let's try to step back and ask more questions. Okay, well, okay, tell me more why you think it is that being as a diverse hire. And what does a diverse hire mean to you? Um, not to assume that it's, you know, because it could be like, well, it was a woman, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay, let's talk about that and talk about gender and that makes some gender differences. And do you know that women still aren't paid at the salary? You know, there's a lot there if it's clear to race. And I'm like, well, tell me, did they tell you it was somebody? Bring me so how did you and tell me why with that and then how do you feel about that and what are your thoughts even if that was the case um, and would it make a difference if right now a hundred percent of the organization is white would it make a difference to you um, and maybe he said no I mean that would make a difference he was the most qualified I was like okay would it make a difference to you if um, their clientele is 60% people of color. Would that make a difference, you know, because, and then, you know, to get at some of that stuff, he was like, don't you believe that representation matters? What might it be or might it feel like for you to never be or to be constantly around folks or in settings where there aren't people that look like you or people who are serving you or working with you, you know, what? how might that feel for you? You know, trying to just be, a bit more curious and start having um, conversations and, and getting them to think a bit more about um, kind of the, the, the situation. And then just in general, I do think sometimes these conversations are hard to have in particular if you're, um, it's just you, um, the only person of color, the only woman, the only um, um, LGBTQ person, what have you, um, sometimes having the conversation can be hard um, and it can also be scary. And um, But what I've been saying to folks, and I really believe it, is that given where we are, that what we really need and what these signs call for is courageous leadership. And that's where I think we're lacking, that we're really lacking courageous leadership. It's, it's easier to sit behind a keyboard and aid for uh, and get on your phone and send and critique. Um, it's easy to sit back and throw darts at people. It's easy to tell other people what they should be be, be doing. But when it, the time comes, and especially if you know that it's going to be hard, it's going to be blowback, or it might be, or it's a opinion that not everybody will support it, particularly maybe in your community. Or it's just been interesting even here. I think about some things that have occurred and happened. And if you listen to the narrative and what's being put out there publicly, you would think that the majority of folks in this sense, um, I'm thinking about like campus, you would think the majority of folks on campus is supportive of a particular issue, right? Then, you know, I remember a particular issue um, where then um, one of the local news stations did a national, they did a statewide poll, and they broke it out by race and ethnicity. And and so what they showed, whereas you would have thought, like, everybody was was on board on campus, because that's what we were hearing. That was a public narrative that was out there. When they did that poll, only um, 6% of... Residents in the state were supportive, 
and I'm, I'm not going to say that always like majority rules, right? Because we know that was the case, and then we would never, we wouldn't be having these conversations, we wouldn't be in these spaces. That's not it, but it speaks to what I'm getting at is the challenges and um, that as leaders we got to negotiate, right? Where there are differences of opinion uh, around lots of different ideals and, and, and there are a lot of different perspectives and viewpoints on a particular issue. So on this particular issue, it was only when he did that statewide poll, only six percent of people were in agreement. Whereas it's like all you were hearing across you know, like faculty and students were in. So, um, and when they broke that out by race ethnicity, only ten percent of blacks were supportive. Now and I mentioned that to say, at the same time, while you know we were hearing the loudest voices and that were public, but folks who were in opposition, including folk of color, they were emailing me, the president, others, you know, that I'm not in agreement. Please don't do this. Blah blah blah. And we said, oh, it would be helpful to share that with your colleague. Oh, I'm not going to share that. For you know, and I know what it was. It was for fear of. Um, that they might um, come under some backlash or be um, painted as being, um, um, well, I'm not going to say those names, but you know, in the community uh, that's not really down to the cause just because they have a different perspective. And I was like, but what really, I was like, but for me that felt like, it was like, no, this is, I've been public that I'm not in agreement. And yeah, and, and I know there's some students that didn't talk to me for like two years about it. But I said exactly why. I mean, this is my view and this is why. And and I think that's what needs to happen as, as a courageous leader. We need to be willing to be out there and own our own stuff and not want folks to always carry it forward for us. And that's where I find all too often people wanting other people to carry, like I said, you know, the work and and, and not willing to go on record on very important issues. And, and I think that that's really difficult. And if that doesn't change, I mean, it really makes it hard for leaders, people like me, um, the president, others who do work because, yeah, I can see from a perspective, why aren't you moving on this particular issue? You don't see that we're getting this outreach from others. You don't see that we're getting outreach from legislators. You don't see from all these people saying, don't do it, you know, other alums and, and so forth. So, um, but um, that, that I'm bothered by it because I think people see it as being supportive that um, outreach behind the scenes. It's like, that's not helpful to me. <laughs> that's not a, I mean, I prefer you not even do it if you're not willing to then, you know, if you're going to let me know, I, I hear you, um, or um, I disagree with um, what folks are proposing here, um, and I want you to know because I'm going to, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on record with that, and it might be, some people might be unhappy, okay, those things, but my point is being willing to go on record with it, and, and all too often, I, I don't. I find that people really aren't, and that's that's challenging for me. Wow, there's so many valuable things that you shared there, um, particularly when it comes to the nuance of some of these situations and listening to understand, like you had said, with people that have opposing viewpoints, like really trying to understand their perspective and allow them to have their opinion, but um, to also have a strong character. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about the integrity. And if people aren't willing to actually speak up and support you, you know, vocally and be candid about their beliefs, then it's almost as if they're being complacent with the status quo. So yeah, I thank you for sharing that. And I think it leads into great into our last question that yeah. we ask all of our guests when it comes to the diversity within our community and um, just the depth and richness overall within um you know just being black and how we all like associate with um you know our own blackness based on our unique backgrounds and um all the different identities that we carry because we are polylithic so that question for you is what does blackness mean to you that's um it's a big, big one question. <laughs> yeah big question. um it's a big question and uh 
an important question, and I want to go back and see how everybody answered them. You know, your previous um, folks that you you've spoken with, but for me, um, blackness means excellence and resilience. Um, we are the descendants of those who survived um, the Middle Passage, um, um, then survived enslavement in uh, this country, then to fight for our freedom and humanity, uh, and we continue to to you know take on that that. I think about uh, all that we've created. We have created beautiful and remarkable cultures that um, many emulate. And it's always, I don't know if you ever think about that, how like to have large groups of people really, the racism that exists towards Black people and anti-Black racism in particular, but yet we're so emulated and, and, and copied. It's just so, it's like this is almost like this disconnect. In some ways you all, you know, you, you kind of want to take from our culture and, and things like that, but um, and then um, want to treat us um, with disrespect and often not see our, our humanity, but we have created um, like said, these, these beautiful cultures that forever that have forever changed the country and and, and all also the the world. Um, I um, I uh, and then even beyond the just the emulation, I, I think about all the the things that folks have done um, when given opportunities. That almost always when we're given opportunities, we excel. And that's why the excellence um, piece uh, that includes in the classroom. Um, that um, includes athletics, entertainment, um, academic leadership, uh, and uh, dare I say, uh, dare I even say, in the White House. And I, I know that many probably yearn for the years of Barack Obama. And so... Again, um, that, that's what I, I, I think of when you all this question. I think about excellence and resilience. Thank you. That was amazing. I don't even have anything to add to it because I feel like you just encompass everything that I was thinking as well. Like we have been the blueprint for so many different aspects of society and people don't acknowledge that, but we need to remind ourselves and be proud of who we are as a community. So thank you, Ricky. Yeah. That's, yeah, thank you well, so I would, much. I would say, I love Blueprint, but we say, we can say we've been the Black Prime. Yeah, okay, I love that. Yeah, so true. And I just wanted to say, like, thank you again so much for giving us so much of your time. I know that it's been two hours, but I'm just, I'm so grateful that we were able to speak to you, learn about your journey. You shared so much knowledge that I think is going to resonate with all of our listeners and, yeah, just I wanted to give you the opportunity to add anything else that maybe we missed covering or if there's any points you wanted to um, further on, just feel free. Well, I, I would just say, um, I just want to say again, thank you all for um, this opportunity um, to be with you all and to, and to talk. Uh, and it's been wonderful, just this back and forth. And I think we need more opportunities like this. So thank you for creating the space and hopefully there's an opportunity to create more spaces like this um, in person, right? And and I think that's what we really need. We need to find opportunities to be with each other and really talk about these critical issues um, and to talk across difference as we um, seek to work together for common goal. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing your experience from all the years overcoming the adversity to now, you know, navigating the system that you're in. And I know this conversation will be very valuable to a lot of people um, as they navigate their personal adversities, their adversities at work, and just their careers in general. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you all. I appreciate you. Yes, thank you. And looking forward to connecting again soon, Ricky. I'll be seeing you here at Diversity Council and 
hopefully I'll also be reaching out to you for advice as yeah, I move forward with the PSO work. So I definitely won't be leaning on you and any others. So <laughs> no, I look forward to connecting with you, you both and, um, and really appreciate the work that you all are doing. You all are impressive and uh, I'm glad to be doing this work and uh, Brad, look forward to getting to know you a bit more. Um, I'm sitting there and as a list, I'm glad we got Tiana on campus. Would love to have you on campus too. <laughs> right? Absolutely. I know. I'm like, come over here, T Dub. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I've put in some applications to no avail, but maybe, <laughs> well, maybe well, one day. All talk. right. I'd be happy go. to. Maybe we can go get some coffee at Boom Boona. <laughs> I, would, I would love <laughs> it. Let, I, I would love it. Just let me know. Let's do it, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, have a good day, uh, Ricky. We'll talk to you soon. You all take care. All right, you as well. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. We are so grateful for your support, and thank you for listening to Identity Unboxed. Authenticity is your guide to cast an impact on the world that you will be proud of. Signing off with pride, Tiana and Brad. Thank you so much.